great. See, this movie actually inspired me. I, I do recommend you watch it. Yes. It's not a movie I would even watch usually, but I couldn't stop watching it. But um, three random people come together with nothing in common for a purpose and plan each in each of their lives, and three common people who really didn't want anything to do with each other. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, go, it, it just reminded me of God's sovereignty in our lives. You know, how he's, he's a lot more in control of, of the little things of our lives and the details of our lives. So when my race is over, it will all make sense when I go to live with God. Someday every person's circumstance, suffering, thorn, weakness, and failure we have gone through will all make sense. God promises that. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, But we, with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the image of, from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. I will see what I was made for when this corruptible puts on incorruption. From glory to glory, from weakness to one day to unimaginable strength. God says he's going to bring us from. 1 Corinthians 15, 36 through 44. Some skeptic is sure to ask, show me how resurrection works. Give me a diagram. Show me a picture. What does this resurrection body look like? If you look at this question closely, you'll realize how absurd it is. There are no diagrams for this kind of thing. We do have a parallel experience in gardening. You plant a dead seed, and soon there is a flourishing plant. There is no visual likeness between seed and plant. You can never guess what a tomato would look like by looking at a tomato seed. What we plant in the soil and what grows out of it do not look anything alike. The dead body that we bury in the ground and the resurrection body that comes from it will be dramatically different. You will notice that the variety of bodies is stunning. Just as there are different kinds of seeds, there are different kinds of bodies. Humans, animals, birds, fish, each unprecedented in its form. You get a hint at the diversity of resurrection glory by looking at the diversity of bodies, not only on earth, but in the skies, sun, moon, stars, all these varieties of beauty and brightness, and we're only looking at pre-resurrection seeds. Who can imagine what the resurrection plants will be like? The image of planting a dead seed and raising a live plant is a mere sketch at best, but perhaps it will help in approaching the mystery of the resurrection body, but only if you keep in mind that when we're raised, we're raised for good, alive forever. You know, when our son Cade was born, you know, I went, I went through a difficult circumstance. He was born with Down syndrome. We weren't expecting it. It was our firstborn. I had all the hopes and dreams of a firstborn son. I was an athlete and had imagined that I couldn't wait to throw the football around and start to see my son develop into a little mini-me. Uh, and all those expectations were shattered, and I just couldn't help but question God and say, what is going on here? What, what is this about? I thought you were in charge of everything. I thought you knit him together in his mother's womb. But yet this isn't perfect. This isn't the way I define perfect. And God and I went through a season of, of struggle, of, of, of me having to relinquish the sense that I know God and how God thinks and how God ought to do things. There was pride and ego that was getting in the way that, that I kind of thought I had this world figured out through the lens of God. And yet that's the greatest sin, to think that we actually know uh, the way God should be doing things. And so through that, I doubted uh, my own faith. I doubted what I had been believing, what I bought into. Uh, and God was gracious through that process, though, and, and helping me come to a, an understanding and a realization that I am not God. And that God has ways and plans and ways of working this world together 
uh, that I might not ever understand, but that I can trust him, that I can have faith and trust that he has my best interest in mind. And even if I can't explain every circumstance that happens, every bad thing that happens in the world, that God's a God that we can trust that's going to be renewing it, that's going to be making something that seems bad to us into something amazing and beautiful uh, for the world. All right, so announcements on uh, the food ministry down South County. Um, we have a few prospects of um, places. We're going to look at the one you sh- sent me, and there's one other we're going to look at too. So, But we need to get over there, right? And so uh, we'll stop probably with 12 meals. That's what I did in Providence, and we're up to 80 meals in Providence. So it'll grow once people get, get word of it. And then um, and let's use that for God and serve people, right, and get the gospel up there. And then the health ministry, just some guys that may want to sign up for that that have the time, like for people who are older or might need the you know, in the winter, their walkway shoveled so they don't fall and things like that. So, looking for some helpers for that. And don't forget, I'll do baptisms until September, right? <laughs> so, if you haven't been baptized um, as an adult and you're interested in that, um, let me know before September. We did. I did one into September last year, and it was a nightmare. <laughs> title of the message today has uh, been running for so long. Let's let's pray before we start. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your word and. Um, we thank you, Lord. There's a lot of um, thinking in your word, Lord, and it goes a lot deeper than um, uh, the surface sometimes we look at as we go through our lives. That you really do have answers for the deep questions we have in our hearts and minds and, and have answers for why we go through the difficulties we go through in this life. And um, Help us to understand how much you really are in control even when it seems like you're not. In Jesus' name, and so before I can get into running for so long, we have to discuss this topic, what makes a house a home. Mm-hmm. That's a nice looking house, huh? It sure is. See, a house does not make a home, though, does it? Mm-hmm. This verse says in Proverbs 21, 19, it is better to live alone in the desert than a quarrelsome, complaining wife, right? Now, I can't just leave the ladies hanging on that one, but look at this one. A house does not make a home in 1 Samuel 25, now think it over and see what you can do because disaster is hanging over our master and his whole household. He is such a wicked man that no one can talk to him. Please pay no attention, my lord, to that wicked man, Nabal. He is just like his name. His name means fool and folly goes with him. You know who said that? Yeah. His wife. Right. You, know, you, can, you can have a nice house, right? But inside can be different. Than, and we try to paint that. We have this perfect little picture of, of things going on. That doesn't mean it's a home. You see, home what's going on inside, right? I mean, some people are just a source of grief in our lives, right? Some people are, you know, in your life are going to be more of a burden than a blessing, right? And, and here we have Genesis twenty six thirty five. They were a source of grief to Isaac and Rebekah. They're only listen. Some people are here only to serve their own agenda. They really don't have you in mind. can't have a home unless the people in it are in agreement. And God said this right from the beginning in Amos 3.3, 3, can two walk together unless they be in agreement? You know, unless you have a group of people who are on the same cause and the same um, goals of life, you're really going to struggle in any relationship. That's something to think about, you know. Right. You can have a nice house, but it doesn't make it a home. Maybe because, you know, home is where your heart is. You've heard that, right? All right? Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And so then you have to, have to ask, you know, where's my heart, you know? Where's the heart of this person, these people in my house? And the Holy Spirit has a house also. Did you know that? In 1 Corinthians 3, 6, he says, don't you know that you, who? You. If you put your faith in his son Christ, God says his spirit indwells you. Don't you know that you are the temple of God? That means you have God's house, right? And the Spirit of God dwells in you. And he's actually questioning, do you know this? And a house does not make a home. If they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. You know, we realize we can do the same thing that people do to us to God's Spirit. You know, 
because the Holy Spirit is a person and he lives in you you're his house that's why it says this in Ephesians 4.30 you do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God in whom you were sealed for the day of redemption and you can actually be a source of grief that God can be inside you going oh this person just like people do to us oh this person you ever go across that person they come, they're approaching you going oh this person Right? All they do is take, take, take. And God's Spirit does the same thing. Oh, this person. Can't have a home unless people are in agreement. Amos 3 3. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Can you actually walk hand in hand with God unless you're in agreement with God? So you can have a nice house, but it doesn't make it home. You can be really dressed and pretty on the outside. See, but what's going on on the inside doesn't make it a home. Home is where your heart is, Matthew 6, 21. For your treasure is there where your heart be also. And the question again is, and the Spirit would ask you, where's your heart? And what did Jesus say? Unless you love me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you can't be my disciple. Because we can't walk together. We're not in agreement. And we can walk our whole lives in disagreement with God and God's plan for our lives. Right? You can have a nice house, but it doesn't make it a home. And we're either following his lead or running from it. You need to understand this, that God won't take second in your life. He won't. John 6, 13, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you in all what? He'll never, what's he saying? Listen, I won't, I won't mislead you in life. You may not understand everything I'm going to do in your life, but you need to understand I won't mislead you because I only am telling you the truth. I'm only leading you on the right path for your life. Home is where your heart is, and you can't be um, at home, a home to the spirit, if your heart is set on things here. Very excited to be with you this week on 100 Hundley Street. I mean, there are some passages I'm fired up about. This is definitely one of them that's kind of like top five of my life. Why? Why? Because we are seeking the things above this week. I'm amazed at how much of Scripture exhorts us and commands us to live for what will be as opposed to the earthly things now. Over and over again, all through the Bible, especially in the New Testament, again, we are commanded to seek the things above, to live for eternity, to go for the hope of glory. Why? Because that's when our lives become most fruitful and effective for the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't it something though, a world obsessed with the temporal and always trying to live for here, and where, but the Bible says the opposite. Look for what will be, live for what will be, and then find your fruitfulness again now as we seek to have eternal mindsets and seeking the things above. Where does that phrase come from? Colossians chapter 3 verse 1. Listen to the powerful word of God. It says this, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Now let's just break down this verse for a second because it's so beautiful. The very first word in the text is if. Other translations say since. If then you've been raised with Christ. Why is that so important? Well, this is the declaration of the text. If you've been raised with Christ. In other words, if you've been set free from sin, if you've been spared the wrath of God, if you've been delivered from the domain of darkness, if you've been transferred into the kingdom of the Son that God loves, if you've been drenched by the mercy and grace of God, if death has no victory over you, if then your hope is absolutely secure, if then you've been raised with Christ. Okay, you know Paul's going somewhere with this now, right? He totally is. If then, the declaration, you've been raised with Christ, now comes the obligation, seek the things that are above. And why would we seek the things that are above? That's where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Isn't it interesting? If you're alive in the Lord Jesus Christ, you can't look at the earth. You look at him, him who is above. This is the calling of our lives, to seek the things above where Christ is. 
I remember so clearly when I first got saved and this truth came flying upon my life, in my mind, renewing it and impacting my heart. I was looking at him saying, wait, I've been raised with Christ. Therefore, I'm to seek the things that are above. You mean I don't have to live for the world? You mean that my life does not consist in the abundance of my possessions? woo I was so excited. I couldn't believe it. Now the world had no grip on me if I saw it right because Christ is the one that I'm living for. That is exactly why in the book of Philippians, Paul says this, but our citizenship is in heaven. Now let me ask you, okay? Are you Canadian? Maybe you're American watching. Maybe you're something else if you're natural again origin. Did you know that if you're alive in the Lord Jesus Christ, that as much as I might be Canadian here, the reality is I'm not actually Canadian. Listen, I'm I'm heavenese. That's right. I'm heavenese. Ultimately, because this my citizenship is in heaven, the Bible says. I'm to seek the things that are above. Let me just show you my passport, which I updated recently to reflect this truth. Notice this. Canada, not so much. Biblically speaking, heaven. That's where I come from. Canadian? I don't think so. Heavenese. Don't mind the picture, okay? Heavenese. That's my reality in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're saved in Christ, that's your reality too. Isn't that so encouraging? If then we've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. Let me just talk to you where you are. I'm getting excited because how can you not with this truth, all right? If you don't know Jesus Christ, you can know Jesus Christ. And so then we remember this. The Holy Spirit is always guiding us to seek, to walk with God and walk with his plan for our lives. And that requires a mindset of seeking things above, all right? And, and been running for so long. Christianity is all about running. You know, it talks about running a race. We're either running the race with God or, listen, or you're running from Him. All right, sometimes life feels like we've been running way too long, doesn't it? You ever get in that place, sometimes you just feel, oh, man, at the end of the rope, right? And, you know, and that's scriptural. You know, we have great men of God. Here we have one right here. Um, and, and that can happen even when you're trying to do the right thing in life feel this way, right? Here we have 1 Kings 19.4 and says, then he went alone in the wilderness traveling all day and he sat down to a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die and says, I had enough, God. Says, That's it. I'm, man, I'm exhausted. I've had enough. I've been running way too long. Uh, just take me. I want to go home. So even when it seems like we're heading in the right direction, we can find ourselves running away from God's plan instead of towards it. 1 Kings 19.8. So he got up and ate and drank and strengthened, strengthened by the food. He traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. So we, here we have the prophet of God who, who, who actually thinks he's heading in the right direction. He's, he's, he's heading towards the mountain of God. How could he not be, right? Well, let's see how that plays out. I mean, there's no way this could be a part of God's plan because the other option was this. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. It says, may the God strike me down and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. Mm-hmm. And so this, she, this is the, the king's wife, and she actually threatens Elijah that she, by tomorrow I'm going to make sure you're dead. Now Elijah has two choices. She, he can run from this woman and the threat she made, or he can stay where he is and stand his ground. And surely he, he's thinking that the right direction, the right path for me to take is the path of least resistance, and so I'm going to run away towards this mountain of God. And so I ask a question, what part of your life is not going the way you planned? Because that's not what he thought. That's not how he thought his life would go. What are you running from? See, we not only find ourselves running from God's plan, but also from the people God put in our lives. Remember this, can two walk together unless they be in agreement? And look, look, look at this verse. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life, and he went to Beersheba in a town of Judah, and he left his was servant behind. You know, sometimes when we're running from God, we actually leave people behind in our lives that God actually wants in our lives. And who was who Elijah's servant? Anybody? Any? It's, uh, who? Elijah. Elijah, right? They're confusing as Elijah and Elisha. But, um, so he leaves this guy behind and he's heading off. He's, he's done. He's at the point, I'm, I'm finished, God. I'm out of here. And sometimes in your life, you're going to feel that way. Like, I, want, I want out of here. I'm leaving these people behind. 
I'm done. I'm going this way because there's no way this could be part of God's plan for my life. So God's plan never seems as powerful as we want it to be. It's not how God works, you know. But look at it. So, he, so Elijah gets to the mountain of God and he's, he's there and um, the Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. And so he tells Elijah, I want you to go out and I want you to stand on the mountain in my presence. I'm going to show you some stuff right now. It's just then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. That had to be a powerful for a wind to shatter, start shattering rocks, right? That's a pretty, pretty strong wind, right? Probably stronger than we've ever seen. And then a great and powerful uh, wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the, listen, but the Lord was not in the wind. Right? And after the wind, there was an earthquake. Whoa, that's pretty powerful. It says, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And I, and I, and I like how the disciples were there with Jesus and people were giving them some, some hot ties and said, shall we call down fire from heaven and consume them? Because that's what Elijah did back in the day, right? Should we show some power here, Jesus? But Jesus says, no, that's not why I came. God's plan never seems as extravagant as we want it to be. See, we want the amazing in our lives. We want to see him move, boom, and just fix everything, and everything goes wonderful and easy, and we just go like that, and it changes. First Kings 19, 12, and after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord wasn't in the fire. And I got like Naaman in the Old Testament when he comes to the, to the man of God and he comes to Elisha at this point and he, he wants to be healed and all Elisha says is, oh, go dip yourself in the water seven times. He doesn't even open the door and meet him. And the guy, he went away angry. I thought for sure, look at this, Naaman went away angry and said, I thought he would surely come out and stand in court before me and call the name of the Lord. Something mighty would happen and clap his hands and I would be healed. And all the guy didn't even answer the door said, go just dip in the water seven times. And so sometimes God's plan sounds so simple and so weak from what we want it to be. First Kings 19.12, and this look, look what really happens with Elijah. And after all, he sees all these powerful things. Now God shows up, but not in the way he expected. How? And after the fire, there was a sound, just a, a gentle whisper. You see, God works in the, in the, the gentle and the quiet things. His, his plan is, is, is so much different than what we would imagine it to be. But the Son of Man came not to be served. What's to serve? You know, so, so often, you know, you know, in Christianity, I always say, hey, you want to be the greatest for God? He, well, he calls you to be a servant. And that's so opposite of what we would. We don't want to be the servant. We want to be the lead. And God works in, gen, in the gentle ways of life. See, God's plan can downright feel or sound like anything but we want it to be for our lives. Verse Kings 19, 13, and now Elijah hears this silent, silent voice after he sees all this power and he hears God's gentle voice. If, if you read the actual scripture, when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face. You see, he wasn't hearing what he wanted to hear. God wasn't telling him what he was hoping to hear. And a lot of times in our lives, God's going to tell us some things we don't really want to hear. He's going to put us, have us in some places we really don't want to be. And we can find ourselves wasting time in our, in, listen, in our stubbornness trying to convince God that our plan is better than his. And this, at this place, you can actually become angry and bitter towards God. Because we deserve better, don't we? 1 Kings 19, 30, when Elijah heard, he pulled his cloak uh, over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. You see, he didn't respond to whatever it is. It doesn't tell us what that small voice says, does it? But he didn't respond to that. He, he went, That's not what I want to hear. And he went out and just stood there. See, in our obstinance, we're hoping God will tell us what we want or he'll change his mind. 1 Kings 19, 13, when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and he went out and stood at the mouth of the cave now God's going to speak again to him. It says, then the voice said to him. At this point, Elijah was hoping to hear something different than what the gentle whisper had already said. Right? And God's plan always has a purpose, even when we cannot see or understand it. Proverbs 19, 20, when many of the plans in a person's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that will prevail in your life. And it doesn't say right there, the Lord's 
plan, right? Because God's trying to get it across that your life has a purpose in his plan. That everything someday will all fall together and make sense. But it won't make sense here all the time. And we are called to live according to his purposes and plan, Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things God works together to make your life terrible. Is that, is that what that says? You see, that's why it takes faith when, you, when, when life is difficult. That's why it takes faith to go, you know what, this is not exactly what I planned, but God said that, you know, if I'm just faithful here, it'll all someday down the road work together for good, and someday it will make sense. And someday I'll be glad that, you know what, I, I, I stuck to it. For those that love him. And really, that's the only qualification that verse, I said that. The only qualification for God to work good in your life is that you love him. Who have been called according to what? Whose purpose? Does it say your purpose? Does it say your plan? According to his purposes in your, in your life. And listen, whenever we question God, and we all do it, we all question him. Come on, how can you not? Life is crazy sometimes. You're like, what the heck, God? What are you doing? I do it all the time. Like I, I, sometimes I feel like I'm like the children of Israel constantly complaining, you know? Why, what are you, come on, you gotta be kidding me. Is that how I feel sometimes? 1 Kings 19, 13, and when Elijah heard it, so he's going to do just that, right? Elijah's questioning everything that God was doing in his life. And Elijah heard it and pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood in the mouth of the cave. Then he heard the voice says, listen, this is the voice says, what are you doing here? What are, what are you doing here? God starts questioning him because he was questioning God's plan. And whenever you start questioning God's plan, he's going to ask you the same, what are you, what are you doing here? Whenever you're off the path of where he wants you to be in your life because you ran away, he's going to go, what are you doing here? So God questions us. Look at what he did with Job. Job 38.2. Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? And what's, what's, you know what he's actually saying to Job? Listen, Job went through some difficult times. If, if anybody probably would have questioned God in the position he was in, he would do it. But he still has the same question with Job. Who are you who's trying to obscure my plans with words, and you just really don't understand what I'm doing. You don't see the end. You're just seeing the immediate now. Why are you questioning me? Job 38.3, brace your, now God's going to ask, brace yourself like a man, because I have nothing, imagine this, I have some questions for you now. You've been questioning me for a while in your life, and God says, I got some questions for you now. Oof, stand up. Like, brace yourself like a man. I want, I want to hear what you have to say. I want to question you now. You've been questioning me for quite a while in your life. You know, like the way it's going is tough. I, want to say, I got some questions for you. So God went on at that point and asked Job 77 unanswerable questions. And this is just one of them. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you even understand how I did that. How did I make the world in six days? Do you understand how I did that? Can you answer? That was just one. Every question he asked is no possible way for us to understand. Who are you to question my plan? He says the same to, to us. But who are you, human being, to talk back to God? So what does form say to the one who formed it? Why did you make me like this? Why, did, why is my life going this way? The same questions he asks Job. Can you really even understand why I, I do the littlest thing in the world? How do you expect to understand my plan in your life? Because we're always trying to figure it out, aren't we? Our whole lives, we spend so much time trying to figure out why we're going through what we're going through and why our lives and why do we feel this way and all these things. God's saying, who are you to question my plans? You're wasting a lot of energy. God has the same answer for us as he did Elijah. You don't, this is it. You really don't have to understand everything that's going on in your life. You don't have to understand. 1 Kings 19.50, the Lord said, get back to where you were before. Go back. All right? Stop questioning the plan and get back to work. I've been running for so long. See, the Christian life is about running. Therefore, seeing we are also accomplished about with such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight that sin which so easily entangles, let us run the race. 
From this time you were born again, you began to run. So when you put your faith in God, you began in a run with God. Running in a way that wouldn't be desired. Because this is the part of the race. Hebrews 12, one, let us run the race with patience. All right? Patience is the capacity to accept or tolerate delay, trouble, or suffering without getting angry or upset. Quiet, steady perseverance through very difficult times of your life. That's the run with God in your life. And that's not a race we would want to be involved with. It's not normally even a slight desire. Running a race we did not plan. Let's run with patience the race that is set before us. All right? The race set before you by God. That your life was well planned before you got here. He says, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. I set you apart to be who you are today. What you do for a living, I set you apart for that before I created the world. You're exactly where I want you to be, and you're going to go through everything and every circumstance in your life, and I've set it up for just exactly for my purposes, not yours. Trust the plan. Because we don't see the final outcome, because we don't trust the plan, this is what we do. We run from it. It's our natural response when life gets difficult, when things get tough, to run away, just like Elijah. And they're not the only guy, right? Jonah 1.3, Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He didn't like God's plan. And he said, God said, I want you to go over here and do this. And he went, ah, ah, whew, I'm going to here. And he ran away. Two grand themes we find through the book of Jonah. The one is the sovereignty of God. I love the sovereignty of God. It is glorious. It brings us security. We, we have the confidence in we're not in charge. Thank goodness. He's in charge. And throughout Jonah, the sovereignty of God over the nations, the sovereignty of God over creation, getting a fish to go and swallow Jonah, the sovereignty of God over Jonah's life himself. The sovereignty of God is everywhere throughout this book, but also under the sovereignty of God, because people say, well, God is sovereign, then what are we, are we robots? Under the sovereignty of God, this is so beautiful, it's also God's heart for, ready, evangelism. It's another massive theme. Jonah is like a mini course in evangelism. And so God is sovereign, but in his sovereignty, we see his heart for the nations. We see his heart to use Jonah to go preach the gospel to the nation of Assyria and the city specifically of Nineveh. So God is sovereign, yet his evangelistic desire to see more and more of the lost found in him. God has such a heart for his own glory. God has such a heart for his glory through evangelism. So God is calling. God is pursuing. God is sending. And right off the bat, we see today in this book of Jonah, the theme of Jonah really running from God, which is our sermon title for today. Some of you are here today and you are, you are running from God. And if you are running from God, I feel sorry for you. Do you know why? Because you don't stand a chance. You say, what do you mean, Robbie? Well, if you're running from God, listen, God's going to catch you. And why? Because he's faster than you. And so he's going to catch you. Why does he catch you? Because he wants to love you. He wants to love you. And he loves you too much to let you go. So if you're running from God today, again, listen, you don't stand a chance. All right? Hey, you can run, but you can't run. God is faster than you. Jonah tried to get away, right? Elijah tried to get away, right? You can follow it throughout the scriptures. When you're running, he's going to catch you. Look how he caught, instead of the fish, him catching the fish, the fish is going to catch him, right? Jonah 117, now the Lord had prepared a great fish and swallowed Jonah up. Are you going down the road, the opposite way I want you to go? I'm going to swallow you. I'm going to stop you. You're going to go exactly the way I want to go. And sometimes in our lives, you know, when we start running away from God, you're actually inviting more difficulty into your lives because God's going to now do some things in your life to get you back where he wants you to be. And he will do what it takes to accomplish his plan for your life. Uh, it's not Jonah. Jonah 117. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. I, you know, honestly, I think if Jonah, I, I, you know, I would, I try to analyze people's thoughts, and I'm going, why did he have to sit in there three days and three nights? Because he was a hothead. One day wasn't enough. 
for him to change his mind and go, you know what? It would have taken me an hour. Right? I was like, oh, crap. Oh, sorry, I got right away. No, Jonah was a hard head. He sat there for 24 hours. I'm not going. And then he sat there for another day. He said, I'm not going back. And after the third day, he goes, I'm going, I'll go back. I'll go back. I'll go back. You see, God will wait as long as it takes for you to change your mind. And when you finally are in agreement with his spirit, Jonah through 10, when he finally came around and said, okay, God, you're right. I'll do what you want me to do. The Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah on dry land. Guess where he vomited him out? Right where he was supposed to be going. He was going in the opposite direction. That fish turned him around, spun him around, brought him to right to the place God told him to go and spit him out. And, said, and what did God say to him? It's the same thing he told Elijah. And then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. He says, go to Nineveh and do what I told you to do. All right? Get back to my plan for your life. You know, but evangelism in that because really that's a big part of the Christian life. God wants to use you to reach out to draw other people to Him. All right, been running for so long, been running for so long. We spend so much time running because there's something we're missing. All we're caught up is in the moment. We're going. Listen, God promises us you're going from glory to glory in the quietness of God's plan. Look at, look at the end of Elijah's life. Look at look what happened here. 2 Kings 2.11 And as they were walking along and talking, suddenly a chariot of fire appeared, drawn by horses of fire, and it drove between the two men, separating them. And God took Elijah on that chariot and carried him off into heaven. See, Elijah couldn't see the great ending of his life. And you can't see the great ending of your life. You can't see what God's actually doing in his plan and how it's going to be powerful in the end. And Elijah couldn't see it, so he was struggling during the difficult times of his life. All right? Oh, my Lord, I just can't hardly wait. We've been worn down in the hardest ways. With long nights over, I'm starting to believe. I'm not as broken as some made me out to be. We can't see that God uses broken things and makes them beautiful on this plan. That the things that you look at yourselves and go, man, I, mean, I wish I could be better or different here. That God goes, that's the very part of you I love. That's the very part of you I'm going to use most in this world. 2 Kings 2.11, as they were walking along. See, we can't see the beauty in our brokenness. Our bodies are buried in brokenness, but they will be raised in glory. They are buried in weakness, but they'll be raised with power and strength. And God put, gave you every broken piece of your life. But one day, you know, he's going to change that. What makes this house a home? Been running for so long. When I met you, I couldn't let you. What makes this house a home? See, are you a house or a home for the Holy Spirit? Are you running with or away from his plan? Romans 8, 18. Look what Paul said. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that someday will be. Someday. Anyways, listen, someday, today, and through our lives, everything is not going to make sense. Right? But someday it will all make sense when I go to live with God. Someday we'll all we'll understand everything we went through and why God's purpose was for us to go through it. And as crazy as it all may seem, listen, he's been part of every broken piece of our lives. And God uses weak things. God uses foolish things. And his plan is gentle and quiet as it goes through our lives. We go from glory to glory, and someday you'll actually see what you were made for. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your word, and, and you know, we thank you for the honesty of it, God. We're not going to understand everything here, Lord, so help us, Lord, to trust you. Help us to trust that you're part of the plan, that you've, you've created us bef the plan before we got here. And so, God, help us to trust you and not run from you, Lord, but embrace your plan. Jesus' name. Amen. That's it, guys.